Welcome to Atomic Structure. So we're in Unit 3. So to start off, what is an atom? Well, you've probably heard this word before. Atom is the fundamental building block that makes up all matter. Last unit we talked about matter and energy, and so matter is anything that has mass or volume, and atoms make it all up. So there's a modern interpretation of an atom. So we're not going to need to talk about the history of the atom. It goes back a really long time. And when I say a really long time, I mean a really long time. So the first person we're going to talk about is Democritus. This is not Democritus. That's just a representation of when he was alive, which was the ancient Greek time. So I'm not going to ever ask you exactly when he was alive, but just for a general idea in the timeline. So Democritus was a philosopher because of the lack of technology. They called thinkers like that philosophers instead of scientists. Um, so Democritus was eating an apple. And no, it did not hit him on the head like Isaac Newton. But he was eating an apple. And as he bit into the apple, he looked inside. And he could see that underneath the red skin of the apple, there was the white flesh. And he knew that if he kept going, he would get to the center of the core. And in the core, there would be seeds. And then he, he knew that if he took one of those seeds and cut it again, he would be able to get even smaller. And, and eventually he thought, okay, so eventually I'm going to reach that point where I can't go any smaller. I can't cut down any further. And that's when he came up with the idea of the atom. Um, so using his senses and observing things around him, that's when the apple came into play. And so called the discontinuous theory of matter... He came up with the idea of the atom, which is from the Greek, which means atomos. Well, the Greek is atomos, meaning indivisible. So atoms are small and indestructible particles. So like a lacrosse ball or a billiard ball, if we were going to represent an atom, it would be a sphere. It would be hard and indivisible. You can't cut it, can't break it. It would just be very, very hard. So everything is made up of these small particles. Now, we do not believe this to be true today. There are parts we believe are true, a part of this, but not everything. So Democritus alive way, way back. And then people didn't really think about atoms for a long time. There's a big gap in our history. And then we come to our next person who is John Dalton. So John Dalton, there he is. He was around a lot later. Now, I like to think about it as why was nobody considering what's going on with atoms for all those hundreds of years? Well, there were like plagues and war and um, for a time, you know, there was the, the church who didn't want people to think about anything being made up of, of things scientifically, you know. So, I mean, you could get into your, your actual history class to talk about why there was all this other time that has passed. But then we get into the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution, and now we're starting to think about these things again. And so John Dalton revisits the work of Democritus, and he comes up with something called an atomic theory. And he finally is a scientist, so he is using experimental methods, which we're not going to get into. If you're interested in that kind of thing, feel free to go ahead and research that on your own. Just know that at this time, we're not philosophizing. We are actually doing experimentation um, in, in a semi-modern chemistry lab. And so from his experiments, he came up with some um, an atomic theory based on Democritus. So Dalton didn't invent anything, didn't discover anything. He just kind of took Democritus's starting point and, and built off of it. So the first part he said that all L elements are composed of tiny indivisible particles called the atoms. So again, we're taking it from the atomos. Now, when we're talking about the elements here, we're talking about the chemical elements. Now, before, in the time of Democritus, the elements were things like earth, air, fire, and water. By the time we get to Dalton, we know about chemical elements. We know about oxygen. We know about hydrogen. We know about uh, copper and gold and all that kind of stuff. So we're we're talking about actual chemical elements, uh, and they are based on, on the idea of atoms. They're made up of them. 
So any of the same elements, so let's pretend we're talking about gold here. All gold elements would be identical, meaning they would look the same. And the atoms of any one element would be different from those of another. So gold atoms look different than silver atoms. And not just, you know, a piece of gold and a piece of silver looks different, but at the atomic level, if we would be able to see. Now, remind yourself that Dalton could not see atoms. Can we now? Yes, in the, in the modern times. But Dalton couldn't see atoms, and that's okay. He knew that they would be identical at their, at their core. Atoms of different elements can physically mix together or can chemically combine in simple whole number ratios to form a compound. So physically mixed together, those are the mixtures. And the other ones is uh, to form a compound, that would be a chemical reaction. Rxn is how we abbreviate reaction. So atoms can just hang out together in a mixture. And, then, and when they're in a mixture, they would maintain their properties. Or they can combine to form something brand new. And that would be called a compound. So that's new. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged. Atoms of one element are never changed into atoms of another as a result of a chemical reaction. So let's, let's talk about the first part. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged, of course. So we're breaking bonds, we're making bonds, and we're forming new things during chemical reactions. And during these chemical reactions, although we're creating new substances, we're not altering the structure of the atom itself through these chemical reactions. So we can't go, if you remember the article we read about um, the ancient alchemists trying to obtain gold from urine. Well, that was not gold, it was phosphorus. And you would never be able to obtain gold through heating phosphorus. It's just not happened. Uh, it cannot happen. So we will talk later on in the year about how we are able to change one element into another. That's not a chemical reaction. It's a different kind of reaction. This guy is not as important as uh, atomic scientists go. His name was William Crookes. Um, there's his apparatus. So we're getting even more modern. Now we're able to go from scientist to physicist, so physics. Uh, he be studied the behavior of gases and vacuum tubes. And so they've been come to be named after him. It's called the Crookes tube. So here in this diagram over here to the left, you can see this is a glass tube. And you have this metal cross here. And there is electricity going through. And you can see this glowing green right here, yellowy green. Um... So it says when gas in a Crookes tube has a voltage applied, so battery, and it's applied to the two electrodes, a positive end and a negative end, which, by the way, all this stuff was not developed here. Like, it was already uh, developed by other people throughout. Uh, the glass wall of the tube opposite one electrode develops a yellow glow, and this is from what we call a cathode ray. Getting into the nitty-gritty of cathode rays in the Crookes tube, we will not be doing that. Um, all you need to know is that he put a gas in a tube and he electrified it. And he saw some glowing, um, and, and I have some, uh, can I erase this? I don't know that I can erase this now that I have, uh, yeah. So anyways, I can't erase it, sorry. So underneath here, that glowing green, and uh, that's what we call a cathode, right? And so in just any gas, you were able to have that glow. And that comes next. So this guy, who is a little bit more important in the history of the atom, um, his name is J.J. Thompson. There he is. And he used a Crookes tube for his experimentation. Uh, again, getting even more modern now. Again, English. Going into his experimentation, J.J. Thompson knew that matter is neutral, meaning no charge meaning that you've got positive charges and it would be equivalent to any amount of negative charges. He also knew, like we do with magnets, that opposite charges will attract and the same charge or a like charge will repel or push away from each other. He already had that information as he was doing his experiments. 
Through his experiments, he discovered the electron. So he discovered electrons. They are negatively charged subatomic particles. So let's talk about what it means to be subatomic. So if you are a, oh my gosh, doo -doo -doo, submarine. This is its telescope, of course. If you are a submarine, you are below the sea, below the submarine, sub. A subscript is below, okay? So subatomic is below or within the atom. So anything that is called subatomic is part of an atom, within the atom. So an electron is within an atom, it is negatively charged, and he was able to discover it using a cathode ray tube. So could he see individual electrons? No, but he could see the presence of them. So here we have our cathode ray tube experiment. Once again, we have that Crookes tube. We've got the glass. This is a little bit more modern rendering. Um, we've got the positive and the negative ends. Don't worry about you know, what a positive anode is or a negative cathode. Don't worry about any of that just yet. Just know that we have, you know, a battery or an electrical source is hooked up to this class and you've got some kind of a gas inside and phosphorescent means glowing, glowing. So you could see this visible glowing strip. Um, and when I, I say strip, I mean a stream, sorry, not, not a strip, it was a glowing beam. He hypothesized that a cathode ray is, ray is a stream of tiny negative particles moving at high speed due to their attraction to the positive plate. So if you are attracted to positive, then this cathode ray must be made of tiny negatives. Negatives would be attracted because he already knew that, opposites attract. So he said that electrons must be part of the atoms of all the elements. So here we have some pictures. Here on the left we have, you can see the glowing ray. And on the right, we're holding just a bar magnet. And this is going to be the positive end of the magnet. We're noticing that it's curving upwards towards the positive. So there's an attraction. This glowing beam is attracted to the positive side of this. So he just put any gas you want inside and he noticed this over and over. And so he came up with something called the plum pudding model. So he was English, so plum pudding I have a picture here of a chocolate chip cookie because I think this is a little bit more appetizing. But a plum pudding, this is like a raisin dessert. But let's go along with the idea of a chocolate chip cookie. So when we're making chocolate chip cookies, we first make the, the dough, like the base of the cookie, which would be the uh, sugar, butter, flour, baking soda, salt, okay? Then when we put our chocolate chips inside, we're not going to just leave them at the top and then scoop from there. We're going to want to evenly distribute those chocolate chips throughout. And we don't want to have some cookies where there's zero chocolate chips and others where it's just totally loaded. We'd rather have each chocolate chip cookie have an even dispersion of chocolate chips. And so from this, he said that electrons are stuck in a lump of positive charge, similar to raisins or chocolate chips stuck in dough. They are evenly distributed throughout the charge. So here we have this green, that is the positive. So the green sphere or, the, or whatever would be the positive. And notice we have these negative blue electrons, these negative charges, they're evenly distributed throughout. And so this is an actual plum pudding. Um, this on top is a holly branch. This is what they they made. It's a traditional English dessert. You you boil it in over water and, it, and then you take it out and sometimes you put a like a brandy or some kind of an alcohol over top over the top and you light it on fire, which is called flambe. Um, but this is a traditional uh, Christmas holiday dessert. But in either case. We're talking about a lump of that dough being being the positives, and then we have negative charges interspersed uh, throughout.
So let's talk about the differences between J.J. Uh, J. Thompson and Democritus. So remember, Democritus just said we have a solid sphere. And you know what? Dalton continued that idea. But now we're here at J.J. J. Thompson. So J.J. J. Thompson says, okay, it's not just a lump that's hard and indivisible. Now we have this positive... And then all around it, we've got negative charges that are smaller. They are within. So we go from the lacrosse ball to the chocolate chip cookie, where we've got the negative charges throughout. And this is huge, because now we know that atoms are not just the fundamental building blocks. There's something smaller within that. And it would be a student of J.J. Thompson's that proves him wrong in a very, very important experiment that's coming up next. But that's it for now.